welcome to a very special episode of 90 Min Talks. We are here at the home of England football, St George's Park, and we're going to be speaking to some of these players as Serena Wiegmann's side gets ready for a World Cup in Australia and New Zealand. So we are here at St George's Park, and I'm very pleased to say that we've been joined by Chelsea and England defender Neve Charles. Welcome, thank you so much for, for joining us today. First of all, how was training in that weather? Yeah, it was interesting. It was definitely different to the last week. I think I, we were spoilt last week. But I love playing in the rain, actually, so it, it wasn't too bad. And yeah, a few girls got a few slide tackles in, but I think we're trying to hold back on them for now. But yeah, it was good fun. How has it been being back in camp? It's been really nice to be back in and sort of get playing football again because I did miss it over the break. What was it like finding out? Can you talk us through um, that moment? Well, everyone, well, you know, when people ask you and you've not really got a good story, well, for once I actually have like a nice story so I knew Serena would be calling us in the morning but I was away with some of my Chelsea teammates and we were sort of riding to a beach and I just thought oh, it won't be now let's just go we were a bit late so I was meant to be at the beach for the time but as we were riding my phone starts ringing so I just pull over on the side of the road whip my helmet off and sort of as I'm answering it my hair's everywhere I'm like hi Serena and then oh she she tells me um, so yeah, that was really, really special and also, obviously I didn't think about it at the time, but having my Chelsea teammates there was really nice because they've spent the whole year with me as well and they, like to see them so happy for me as well was really special. Did they all stop as well? Yeah. Did everyone stop <laughs> so on the every side of the road? Well, everyone sort of stopped like, so I could see some in the distance and then some a bit closer and then obviously they left me and then I was like... You were jumping up and down. Yeah. <laughs> over, yeah. So actually it was a, it's a really nice like... For once, there's a nice story yeah, about it. Yeah, I like that. That's a good one. It will be your, your first major tournament with England, so I guess there's a lot of excitement around that, a lot of anticipation. What are you kind of thinking about the month or six weeks ahead? When you say it like that, or like the, yeah, it's going to be a long time, I don't really think too far ahead. I think that's the way I've just been throughout the season. I think that's the way a lot of us are, but I'm really excited to go down and sort of, who, it's sort of like an unknown at the moment, so I'm excited to sort of get into it and see what happens. Have you got any advice on, you know, your first major tournament? Does anyone give you any advice or told you what you should do or how to approach it? Uh, no one's actually said anything specifically to me, but I think from hearing from other people's experiences and even my experiences from like youth age groups and like being away when I went to the Olympics and stuff, being away for a long period of time, I think you pick up things that sort of going into it, you're better prepared every single time and you sort of know what to expect and what to deal with it for sure. What's the kind of plan now I guess as you as you build up to going down to Australia? Uh, I think these two weeks um, sort of get the body back in order thankfully we haven't lost too much but it's amazing how a few days off when you're used to training all the time like you suffer for a few days but I think time on the grass together sort of getting connected and having as much time together working on what we want to work on and obviously it's great that we've got the game next week um, so this will be training hard, I think, this block with a bit of family time in the middle, which is really nice. Uh, and then, yeah, down to Australia and hopefully getting over the jet lag pretty smoothly and, yeah, we'll take it from there. Um, in terms of your, your season this year and leading up to this point, you've had a pretty, pretty good year, I would say. How has it felt? Has it been one of your best at Chelsea and with England? Yeah, I've really enjoyed it, I think. But don't get me wrong, there's been ups and downs in it, I think, because it's such a long season, so much happens. Uh, but overall, yeah, I've really enjoyed it and I think learnt a lot and... Thankfully with Chelsea we had a pretty successful year so that's always nice when you sort of get that yeah, feedback for yeah, putting in so much work. It must give you so much coming into camp when you've had such a successful year both personally and with your club. You must just be on a high. Yeah, I think it's different because sort of when, when I come here I sort of put my England hat and when I'm at Chelsea it's Chelsea hat. So I do think there is a distinct separation between them but yeah, definitely for sure when I'm on the ball. It, yeah, it feels good. I've enjoyed it this year, so hopefully I'm hoping I can just continue that in this camp. Talk to us about your England debut. Um, what do you remember about that day and how, how do you feel about it? Well, it wasn't the best day, but I remember sort of when I got a bit of perspective afterwards, like a long, well, a bit of time afterwards, I was like really proud and yeah, I couldn't believe I'd actually done it. But I just remember in the moment it was COVID, obviously it was a weird time. Obviously we didn't win, like it was, but actually looking back, I think, that was sort of, that's sort of part of I think football. It, like, it's not all fairy tale. Like, I, it was partly I was so proud and I, I couldn't believe it. And then other part, it was just the reality of this is just another game and yeah, where we were on our journey there. How has working with Serena impacted you? Yeah, I think 
I always say like being with Emma at club and Serena here, I think one, it's really nice to see these incredible women being so successful and leading amazing teams. And I think the, the way Serena's sort of come in and been really clear with her identity, it made the team so easily able to adapt so quickly as well. Um, I think she's, she's really clear with what she wants and sort of gets that message across so it's not overloaded, it's just very succinct. And yeah, I think the way she's sort of gelled with the team as well, bought her ideas, but also been open to sort of what we've built over the however many years. Um, it's sort of worked really, really well. When you look at the, the group in, in Australia, but Haiti, Denmark and um, China, China, sorry, <laughs> brain blank at the moment. Um, yeah, China, when you look at those opponents, what, what are you kind of expecting from them? And obviously you, you probably are favourites to top that group. So just kind of looking at it game by game, I guess. Yeah, I think it's, it's what's so special about the World Cup is you get so many different brands of football, even within the group. So I think that's something I'm definitely excited for from game to game. It also makes it very challenging. Um, but it's so exciting that you're going to have to adapt from game to game because each opposition is going to have sort of a different brand, a different way of playing. But also fo it's so good that like football's universal, there'll be some commonalities between it. But yeah, I think they're definitely going to pose different uh, threats. But obviously it'd be nice also to play against Penilla as well. And obviously there'd be other girls that know other girls on the team. So yeah, really looking forward to it. I was going to say, you, you said earlier you keep you like to keep Chelsea and you're, then you're with England, they're separate. But you're coming up against, I know you're good friends at Penilla Harder. That's going to be weird, isn't it? Yeah, so she was one of the people I was on holiday with when <laughs> I found out. Um, but So yeah, from a French point of view, I can't wait to see her and sort of, also I hope she has an unbelievable tournament as well because I think she sh showed at Chelsea how amazing she is. Um, but yeah, so I'll be really excited to see her, but obviously on the day it's very, very professional and I think everyone gets so used to that. It's like your best of friends, but then you're, you're very, very professional and then you can be best of friends after as well. Step on the pitch, it's a different story. Yeah, it really, really is like that. It's very, very black and white and I think everyone learns to do that. When you when you look at the tournament as a whole, who are you would you most like to come up against, either a player or, or a team? I mean, I think everyone always says to to be the best, you've got to beat the best. So I think also from a fan neutral point of view, having some amazing teams come up against each other, it's only good for sort of the excitement around the tournament. But I think it's a credit to the women's game how far it's come that there's so many teams that will have the same dream as us going into this tournament. So. I think no matter who we come up against sort of on the journey, it is going to be a difficult test and I don't think you could really call it because so many people, I think players playing at club level have had so much experience with the big games now and with their international teams as well. So it's going to be very interesting sort of to see. What are you most looking forward to in terms of your experience in Australia? And is there anything you're not looking forward to? Are you afraid um, of spiders? Yeah, well, actually, when I say, because I was asking Sam about it and I was like, because I always think there's snakes everywhere, there's tarantulas everywhere. And she was like, no, I've literally seen it once in my life. But obviously, she will downplay it and maybe it'll scare me. So that's probably one thing I'm not looking forward to. Um, but my family's going to be out there. So I think I'll be, it'll be really exciting to sort of see what they're getting up to and be able to see them. Because we haven't all been together for so long because we're all off doing our own thing. So that's something I'm really excited about. And just to explore an if another part of the world. And from the little bits I've seen, it looks beautiful. The ultimate goal is to win, win the thing. But your hopes personally from the tournament, do you have little goals that you have along the way? Yeah, I think I don't, I haven't thought too far ahead about that, but I think knowing me, it will be like to come out, to set myself little goals so that I come out of it and I can know that I've done what I can control. The things that I can't control, I can't, but just to focus on what I can control and have sort of made strides throughout the tournament and ultimately have helped the team the best I can um, in whatever role and sort of, I think that's everyone's goal is just team first and yeah. Hopefully it can be a memorable summer. Brilliant. Well, fingers crossed for you. We're delighted to see you included in the squad and hopefully uh, Lioness is going to do it again. Fingers crossed. Thank you very much. Guys. No worries at all. Um, we did, of course, also get to speak to Laura Coombs and Katie Robinson, not just Neve. Um, so we have another couple of interviews coming to you now. Hi, Laura. Congratulations on being here. How, how did it feel to get that call from Serena to say you were going to the World Cup? Yeah, it was good. I was a bit, I was overcome a bit with emotion, to be honest, and I had loads of things that I'm, maybe wanted to say and but yeah it was just my, relief and happiness and so happy to be here. Felt really proud, um, quite emotional, um, yeah just so proud and honoured to, to get that selection. 
and uh, how's camp been so far? It's been a little bit different maybe? Yeah, no, it's been good. I think we're really excited um, for the summer and you know, now it's the preparation time to ensure that we're ready. It has been a, a long term coming, so do you feel all of that dedication and hard work has been kind of worth it? Yeah, well, I think back to the years and all the training that's been put in and I'm just so glad that yeah, I, I get to put this on my CV um, for my career and you know now I'm here I just want to work so hard and give myself every opportunity to maybe play some part of it. You've got a big flight ahead of you going all the way across the world. Yeah. Could you give me your book to read on that flight? I can't lie I'm not a big reader so I'll probably be watching things. Read, I'm a bit geeky, I like geeky books at the minute. <laughs> I don't even know why I'm admitting this, but um, I'm reading Why We Sleep, which actually is pretty boring and it does send me to sleep. Any music that you love watching, listening to? Um, all sorts. Um, big range, to be fair, um, but any, any new stuff that's out, really. You're in camp now. You've been in for about 24 hours, I think. Yeah. Is it feeling a bit different to other camps, a bit more buzz about the place? Um, I don't know. It's definitely, you know, you're working for something now. There's um, obviously the last few camps we've had games, but now there's something serious on the line, so... You know, everyone just wants to put their best foot forward and, yeah, be as sharp as they can in as quick time possible. So we promised you some current Lionesses, so thank you to Katie, Laura and Neve for sitting down with us. Now we've got our panel to talk all things World Cup. We've got Sophie, other half of Girls in the Ball, my other half, and we've also been joined by former Tottenham and Crystal Palace goalkeeper and current athletic women's football editor, Chloe Morgan. Welcome to the show. Cheers, thank you guys. Thanks for having me. You've got both the player and the media hat on for us today, so you can give us all of the insight. All no of pressure. the perspectives. Yes, everything. Are we looking forward to the World Cup? We're, we're all going to be there, aren't we? Yeah, yeah I I've not really thought about it now. <laughs> um, Did we bring the wrong person on? Um, well, you know, I heard something <laughs> big was happening this summer. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like all of our focus has just been completely dedicated to this for the last, you know, mm, Not me. Six months. You've done no planning, so. <laughs> Didn't even know it was uh, on until last week, to be <laughs> fair. Yeah. We are going, though, aren't we, together? We are going together. We're all going to be there um, having a great time. I'm really looking forward to it because it feels like a proper adventure when you're in country like fully away from home there's no popping back for a couple of days when you're down under you're down under. I want to be I want to be immersed in it immersed in the culture I've never been to Australia before I've never been to New Zealand you guys are going to be there I feel like we could have like is it schooners is it sco schooners is that You've what they been say there? you been there I live there I can't remember what a schooner is yeah I thought it was like sure. an Australian beer oh, okay and now it looks silly you do a bit yeah we'll have to cut <laughs> that though I'm not sure uh, we can include that in this one we have also though seriously just come from England's first training session first training camp um, since the Lionesses have been called up. What did we think? It was a, a dreadful, dismal day out there, but the football looked fun. It was torrential. I mean, arriving, it was torrential. And I was expecting that the sun would come out. It's a glorious day. We've just seen our new face Lionesses. Um, and to be fair, they came out onto the pitch with so much energy, like so much vibrancy. And it just felt, and obviously they've got these beautiful new night kits. They're stunning. Um, and I think everyone was just excited, like the media, we were all excited, but also there was like some schools and like some young girls and young boys in the, like, in the crowd as well who were kind of like seeing the Lionesses and, and Serena came out and she looked all excited and happy. So it just felt like there was a big buzz around it. And that, that was the first time I'd kind of seen it in like, person since the big announcement. So I think there's, we don't often remember that there's um, these kind of moments don't come around all of that often just because we've got back to back tournaments. It feels like we just did the first, last one, but actually, you know, they're really special moments and this is our what, fifth, I think. Um, and every single one of them has been a special memory or special adventure for us. So I think you can only imagine what the players are thinking at this moment in time when they're what, a month now away from, from going, going to Australia, going to the World Cup and kicking it all off. Yeah, Laura Coombs was saying beforehand, you know, someone asked her if like, if she's still kind of up in the air, like, oh my God. And she's like, no, now we're in camp, focus is on, countdown is on, you know, and, and Serena has spoken in the past about roadmaps and journeys. And I feel like she's a very diligent manager who's like, they know where they're supposed to be now. They know where they need to be next week, you know, and there's a real roadmap. Um, I know we've spoken and we will get to it about like the, the squad and are we lacking some experience? But when you look at some of those youngsters out there who've never been to a major tournament in their first camp, you know, they looked excited. We spoke to both um, Laura Coombs and Katie Robinson, obviously, and, you know, seeing them going into, into their first major tournament, that must be some excitement. You know, you could feel it out there for them. 
that's huge to be that young and to be put into such a you know high profile demanding challenging situation and not anything that's even close to home i mean some of the players in the, the media zone were saying that they you know they weren't even going to have family and friends out there they were going to be doing this you know by themselves and and i think obviously we're going to talk a little bit about some of the players that are out there but having that experience is only going to help them sort of get adjusted to, to a big environment like this but so exciting to see some of the younger talent coming through like esme morgan that's absolutely massive um yeah and even like lauren james like you forget sometimes because she obviously plays you know such incredible football and has this big high profile name that she's only like early 20s like it's mad to be that young so talented and now be heading out to go and play on the world stage it's huge when we think about preparing for this world cup there was obviously a lot of talk about with the eca and, and fifa and we've, we've spoken about it on previous shows and the players obviously came in yesterday i know there'd been some negotiation about bringing it back from the 10th of july i think the eca said the 23rd and 24th and then there was some negotiation about bringing it back further how do we feel about that conversation do we think is it a hindrance you know do those four days really matter or is the fact that you know they're going over the other side of the world the more prep the better i think i mean they probably do matter those four days it seems quite a, f a few amount of days to be arguing over but they probably do matter in terms of the plans that the Lioness has had in terms of building players up to the right fitness and especially with the travel as well, you know, it takes two days to get over there. Mm -hmm. And then I think they said something like four days to get mm -hmm. over the jet lag. So you're, you're dealing with a lot of different components. Um, I think that argument should have, had, ha should have happened a lot earlier. It came to the fore in, you know, end of April, beginning of May, I think. Actually, those conversations should have, should have happened last July. Um, and it shouldn't have been put on the players to, to come into this either. Um, and it, it really shows that you, these authorities need to work together to make the whole game a better place for everyone involved. Um, everyone, I think, sometimes works in silos, it feels, and they're all doing their own thing. And then they get surprised when, you know, they're like, oh, this, there's something bad happening <laughs> or this is a problem or we have to climb over this mountain. And then, then they're not actually talking to each other anyway. So. Um, for me, it was a bit of a, a hindrance in that respect, but I think now that the Lionesses are here in camp, I think all of that is put to one side, right? Yeah, and I think like this whole thing kind of came about from the ECA where they spoke about it being a hangover from the professionalisation of the game and also off the back of, of so many injuries. And obviously there are big injuries in England squad. We're missing Beth Mead, Fran Kirby, Leah Williamson, you know, the latest to be out. How do you think that's going to affect the squad? We obviously got, there's a, a lot younger players in the squad, the, the average age has come down by about two years now in, in the squad. I think four days is absolutely huge. I mean, when you look at how, you know, the quick turnaround that you sometimes see between WSL games, sometimes they're only having two or three days. And I think, you know, in terms of like the preparations or behind the scenes, I mean, that affects your recovery times, that affects your rehab plans. I mean, you know, you look today about Millie Bright, she was obviously, you know, doing the rehab and her knee injury work and, and hopefully she's going to be full fitness when, when things eventually kick off. But I think it has a, has a massive impact in terms of you know, trying to get that cohesion with the players as well. I mean, the earlier you get them in, whilst it might not be ideal in terms of the gap they've had between the WSL ending and coming in for the international um, camp, it also means that they have more time together to bond. A lot of these younger players won't have been in such a high profile, intense environment before. And I think, um, you know, even just sort of, you know, having that chance to, you know, have a couple of down days, have that time to bond, to get together, to maybe do some like fun stuff, some activities around the camp. So. Yeah, it matters from a, a rehab, a kind of, you know, recovery perspective, but also just like the emotional well-being of the players. So, and Serena knows what she's doing. I mean, she's seen the pandemic, the epidemic that we've got going on with the injuries in the WSL. So she'll be alive to the fact that, you know, she doesn't want to put the players in position where they're going to be more injured. So she would only want to do what's best in their best interests. I think it was really interesting. I think we kind of forget last year what happened. So leading up to, yes, we were unbeaten leading up to the, to the Euros. But actually, things didn't really fall into place until they started doing their preparation camp for the Euros. And um, they made a few changes after that first friendly game that England won pretty solidly. But you never ever saw Leah Williamson play centre midfield again after that point. And it wasn't literally until probably about six weeks before the tournament started that every piece of the puzzle kind of uh, fell into place. And I think that's where this happened, is in, in St George's Park, where they got to spend a lot of time together figuring things out. And you can only think that the same will happen this time around if they're here for the next, you know, however many weeks all together. It's where we start to put those pieces together, which you can't do so well when you've only got 10 days together at a time and you're doing different, facing different opponents or going to different places as well. 
um, in those like international breaks. This is the time where they can really sort of hone in on the plans and, and, and the project and really focus on what the challenges ahead. And we have to factor in as well, they are going home at weekends, right? Like, so it's not kind of a full, full camp yet. That comes a little bit later. And they, they did similar um, for the Euros as well. One of the big topics of conversation at the moment, as we all kind of think about who's going to start, who's going to be the starting 11, you know, we've had this conversation, is she going to have a starting 11 the whole way through the tournament again, Serena, like she did at the Euros. But one of the big topics is who starts up front. You've obviously got Rachel Daly and Alessia Russo. Now we have to pause for a minute because obviously we're all focused on the Lionesses, but recently, Alessia Russo announced that she was leaving Manchester United and that's been the biggest news in the WSL at the moment. They've also just gone and lost Ona Baggio as well. Less of a surprise maybe, I mm. guess. Um, but that kind of whole Alessia Russo rumour started back in January. Arsenal were coming in for her, looking to pay one of the highest fees. Now it looks like she's gone to Arsenal potentially free, which seems mad. Do you think that's something that like she's thinking about now in camp or... Do you think that, that she kind of had that done and dusted and, and now she's Lioness's focused? I think she knows where she's going, right? So 100%. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't think she's too worried about it. I think that's probably why they announced it before camp, a couple of days before camp. Get it out there, get it done, get the news headlines out of the way so she doesn't have to deal with that when the transfer window opens at the end of June, beginning of July, and it all comes up. I, I think they, they needed that, personally. You wrote a story, obviously, about it as well. Um, with your media hat on now, do you think people will be asking her questions now in these mix zones are having, or, or do you think we're all just Lionesses focused? I think, um, I mean, the priority has got to be the Lionesses focus, but we're not even that far away from the start of the season. I mean, this, this year just seems to be going so quickly. And, and I think, obviously, there's just so many signposts pointing towards Arsenal at this point. And I know there were a few rumours about you know, the NWSL coming in for, you know, and, and rightly so. I mean, she's that high calibre. And not just in terms of you know herself as a, a player and a high performer and the potential that she's got because she's still so young, but also the commercial value that this player holds. I mean, people will change clubs because Alessia Russo has gone to X club or whatever it is. So, and the shirt, the shirt sales, like she's part of Gucci, like she's she's a big deal. Like she, everyone wants to know where that player is going. So, yeah, she's going to be um, she's hot property. Like people want to know what's happening with her. But I 100% agree with Saif. Like she will. 100% know where she's going. There's no way in hell that she would have made that announcement not knowing <laughs> what door she was entering. I did love, did you hear, I, I can't remember who she was talking to, Casey Stoney, she did an interview with um, a journalist in, in America and um, he asked her about the, the prospect of Alessia Russo coming to the NWSL and she was like, she's not coming to the NWSL. If she was, I would be in that conversation and I would be getting her at San Diego. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure she's not going to the end of the because Casey Stoney said so. OK, so we kind of know where she's going domestically. Where is she going for the Lionesses? Is she starting? Is Rachel Daly starting? I think it's, they're two different questions in a way. It's like, is she going to start or should she start? So for me, should she start? No. OK. And that hurts me because I'm a massive Man United fan, even though she's not with United anymore, obviously. And I, you know, I feel a little bit emotional. Are you going to hate her now? It is what it is. All right. I've got to respect her, her decisions. Um, but I think when you kind of look at the form that Rachel Daly has had over this entire year, what she's achieved, top WSL goal scorer, obviously golden boot, um, and just what she's done with Villa and credit to Carla Ward as well for, you know, what she's, what she's achieved with the team this year. But and you look at someone like Russo and on paper, when you look at some of the stats that she's got about uh, chance creation and goal scored. She's still sort of around the fifth, sixth, seventh place in terms of like th those kind of abilities at the moment. So I'm not saying that she won't progress at a club, but I think she needs to be quite careful about what club that she does go to. So she continues to get those opportunities to play and develop. But I think if we're talking about Serena with her, you know, we're going to win this tournament type head, which is the only head that Serena has, I think it's got to be daily because the, the experience is there as well. But how is that going to work with the Toon partnership if Toon makes a start in 11? So for me, I, I agree with you that I think Daly has to start. And that's no slight on Alessia Russo. She's absolutely a fantastic player. But with her numbers, as you say, she has to start. And she also plays that more like, if we're looking back to last summer, that Ellen White type role, the really like out and out pure number nine goal scorer who will hassle and harry the central defenders, literally tire them out. And then you, you put on Alessia to do do her thing and, mm -hmm. and be able to work work around that. I think it feel, where it feels harsh is that you did really feel that last summer it was Alessia Russo's kind of apprenticeship and that this year was going to be her stepping up to that number nine full stop. And it has been in, in the kind of qualifiers and friendly since that point. Do you but feel actually, like she's shaken off the super sub shackles 
yet. Well, you feel like she should have done, but the problem is you've got a striker in Rachel Daly who's gone and scored, what, 22 goals in 22 games. Um, and it's kind of a slightly un 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 unexpected <laughs> problem for Alessia Russo because Damn. She, she, she was probably like, well, I'm in great form. I'm scoring goals for, for club and country. And I, I w waited my turn. I waited for Ellen White to retire. And now it's my turn to go up. And now Rachel Daly just sort of swung in out of nowhere and, mm -hmm. and kind of became the best striker in the country. So it, I think it's super hard, isn't it? So um, you do kind of feel bad for Alessia Russo in that respect because she's not actually done anything wrong. She's playing well. She, she's just a different kind of striker to the others. Um, but I think her ability to come off the bench and change a game is so crucial. And we saw it last summer. Yeah. And we've seen it as well for United at times this season. Yeah, it's second to none. So, OK, so we, we, we feel like we're fairly sure on who should be number nine. Does Serena know her starting 11? Mm. Pretty Can much. I sit on the fence a little no. bit? A little bit? No. Just a no, tiny, just I'll a push touch. you off. Just a little bit. <laughs> okay, go on. I just think the size of the World Cup, the amount of games that we're going to be playing is so different to what we saw in the Euros. And I know, you know, Serena always had a starting consistent, you know, 11. I'm thinking in the group stages, especially where we do have, you know, a couple of the sort of more easier games, that she uses that as a bit of a chance to see what Russo can do and Daly can do as a starter. So I'm going to say she starts both in one of those group stages okay. and then sees. Okay. I think if you've qualified by the second game, you change it up for the third game. Yeah. Um, but Serena is Serena and she has her methods of doing things which have worked so well and I don't know why you mess with that kind of winning formula and these next few weeks are about her really nailing down that, that starting 11 for her. Um, I think she probably knows the majority of her 11, um, obviously depending on some fitness worries, uh, I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't be too surprised if it's the same 11 pretty much the whole way through. Plus, when you look at the World Cup, it is harder. Mm -hmm. There are more teams obviously involved, more top teams involved. And when you look at England's half of the World Cup, I think it was Tom Gary who said it, that um, you know England's half, they have that half until the final. There's no kind of potential for someone coming from New Zealand into the, the, the um, Australia half. So they've got your... France, your Germany, your Brazils, your Australia, they're all in that half mm -hmm. of the draw and that's a really, really hard draw. Hard. So, you know, it's that it's it's another element, I guess, and Serena Wiegmann's been there before, but another element for her to consider. And and of course Serena Wiegmann did after winning the Euros with Holland in twenty seventeen take them the Netherlands to the final of the World Cup against the USA. So potentially same again, please, <laughs> with a different outcome. But I do think, like, I think that it, it throws up a different dynamic as well with the World Cup because you have teams who have very different styles of play. So the USA, the way they play, is completely different to Brazil. It's completely different to Germany, to Spain. And we saw a touch of that in the Euros, but not to the same kind of disparity, I think. So it'll be interesting to see then whether, you know, squad depth is going to be massive here, especially with, you know, the kind of outlets that you'd have with, like, Bright and Liam, well, Leah Williamson being definitely out, Bright still a little bit uncertain about. You know, the avenues that you did have with some of those longer range passes and things on d different styles of play. So I think you are going to have to utilise more players, maybe. I think you're right, because even if you look at our group, uh, England's group with um, China as well, they play so differently to other styles of football. Haiti. And Haiti, you're, with ha Haiti, you'll probably have a, a bank of two fours to break down, if not five at the back. You know, that you, you might be going up against pretty much a, a ten-person wall <laughs> and one striker. So, um, and Millie Bright will just go straight through that. <laughs> straight through. She's not even up front. So they're going to have to have different game plans available to yeah. them to be able to... Because they're not going to be playing like you, they would, a Sweden would play mm. or a France would play where you know you're going to get pretty attacking football, so you can kind of utilise that to your ability. You have to break them down. You're playing against teams who are actually quite happy with the point um, and, and they just don't want to concede. So that's kind of the, the challenge for England, I think, is that all of the pressure will be on them to break down their opponent and you probably will have quite a quiet game at the other end, yeah. but you, you have to find the answers to those puzzle pieces. So we are going to talk a little bit more about England's dangers, so don't, don't give everything away yet, because first we want to do some fun predictions. So we've got ourselves some lovely whiteboards and some even better wipes, which just I think are totally worth showing. Um, okay, first question, mm. who has the strongest squad? Now, for me, define strongest. Is this the best players or who we think is going to win? So I want you to tell me this when you're writing down your answers, why you picked the squad you're picking. Are we all showing at the same time? Go. 
Germany or said Spain. Lioness is Chloe, is this gonna be your answer for everything? You're just not gonna rub that out. You, now, you have you? to wait and see. Okay. <laughs> talk talk me through it. Well, I don't need to. Right. That's really helpful <laughs> for a um, video blog. <laughs> they are uh, European champions. They also have the best goalkeeper in the world. Yes, the back line looks a little bit fragile. <laughs> <laughs> But also, when you look at the kind of attacking presence that we now have, Beth Lindgren's been on absolute form. She needs to come in. Russo is going to be feeling herself because now she's got the big move behind her. And also, Rachel Daly, as top goal scorer, has been absolutely flying. So I think if we've got the threat there, and we've also got Mary Epps in goal, I mean... OK, well explained. Thank you. So Germany, I've gone with Germany because they obviously lost to England in the final last summer, but they pretty much kept the same squad together. I think uh, she's picked 20 of the 23 that went to the Euros last summer as in her squad this year. And the three that are missing are either out through pregnancy or injury. So she's pretty much sticking to her experienced players. Alexandra Pop is fit. She is the Bundesliga's top scorer, uh, 16 goals last season. She is phenomenal. And I think as long as they can keep her fit, they have every chance of lifting the trophy. OK, fair. I've gone with in terms of best players as opposed to maybe who I think will necessarily win. I think Spain have got some of the best players in the world. I think the fact that they've gotten back quite a few of the 15 who went on strike is key. They've got Aitana Bonmati is back. Alexia Puteas is playing. Um, they are missing uh, maybe two or three uh, of that 15 and a couple weren't called up. But Spain have still been doing well without those 15 in the preparation. So the thing is for me, I don't know whether mentally and cohesively as a squad how well they'll do in the tournament. But in terms of the strongest team, I think Spain. All right, hit me. Are you ready for the next question? Who has got the best form going into the World Cup? Three, two, one. Who have we got? Oh, look, we've all gone the same. Come on. All right, OK. I think we can all get on board with this. Go for it. Tell me why. Well, bar, obviously, the last defeat, um, that they had, I, they've had a massive unbeaten run and they've just come off the back of winning the European Championship. I just, I, I mean, it speaks for itself, doesn't it, really? Conspiracy theory, they wanted to get rid of that. They wanted to get that loss out of the way the before the World gone. Cup. Yep. Do it for the World Cup, then you don't have to worry about doing it in a World Cup, right? No other team has gone on a 30 game unbeaten one any time recently, I don't think. So maybe the USA a couple of years ago. But like, for that run, other than that defeat against Australia, as you said, Chloe, it's um, yeah, absolutely key and really good for their confidence despite that loss. Next question. I feel like we might all be on the same page with this one. Hit me. Who's got the best manager or who is <laughs> the best manager? Oh my Lord. I always struggle with the name of this team. Which is funny because you write it so often. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> are we ready? <laughs> Three, two, one. Okay. Lioness is Serena, Serena, yeah. Did you draw a crowd as well? Look at that. That, that is her face. <laughs> That's actually offensive. Where's her hair? <laughs> one of our nation's icons. Anyway, do we need to explain? Go on, tell us why, Serena. Although I, I think mean, we all know. I mean, she's the queen, isn't she? She's the queen of football. She's, what, the best manager in the world at the moment. And she won the Euros with the Lionesses last summer, having taken the Netherlands to a European Championship win and uh, the final of the World Cup last time out. So. She's right up there at the top of the game. She is the best international manager is. Can you add to that? What Saif said. Yeah, mm. cherry on top, lovely. Beautiful. All right, that was easy. Next question is who has got, or who is the toughest group? Which group is the toughest group? This better be good. Expecting like a Mona Lisa or something. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm ready. Okay, three, two, one. Oh, we have all said B. So group B is Australia, Ireland, Canada and Nigeria. Yes. As an Irish person, I can confirm that is a very, very, very hard group. I am concerned for you. Yeah, a little bit. So Ireland opened against Australia. They opened the World Cup against Australia in front of a sold out stadium, Australia in Sydney. That's a big challenge. Canada are going through huge problems with their Canada soccer. So they're a bit of an unknown. They haven't been able to play at home in over a year, I think. Mm. They have no warm up games other than a behind closed doors friendly with England and um, Ireland have to travel 8,000 kilometres in the group stage alone. So, and Nigeria are the African champion. Well, they're the best team in Africa, so problematic. So it's tough, for, it I think, tough. for anyone in that group, and particularly someone with an Irish hat on, it's tough. I don't even think a Ryanair flight would make it to Australia. <laughs> no, no, yeah, absolutely not. We should even cut that, because they don't deserve that plug. Um, 
<laughs> right, we should let's... Who is the best player going, the to, the whole world, tournament. going to the World Cup? Oh, this is so hard. There's so many to choose. <sighs> Lost my head and then realised where I was. You ready? Yep. Oh! Oh, we all got something different. All I right. like that. And I think they're all good shouts as well. Mm -hmm. Go. Uh, she's the best goalkeeper in the world. Uh, WSL Golden Glove. Uh, part of the European Champion. Uh, uh, the pro. Ninety percent of the reason uh, that England won the European Championships last year. Fold. Um Goalkeeper union. And just an all-round amazing person. And she's a goalkeeper, and I happen to be one of those ex. Okay. So yeah. There you go. Good shout. Tell us. Tell us why. Sam Kerr. She is born for this moment to lead her country out on home soil, and she can make miracles happen for that Australia team. She brings energy to them like no one else can. She's the best, one of the best strikers in the world. She is an iconic icon. She's on that front of that, what, the FIFA game cover, so yeah. Good choice. Aitana Bonmati from Spain. She's a magician. That's Simple it. As. She's a magician. She's amazing to watch play. The, she pulls the strings for that Spanish team and she's totally underrated. So for me, she is... And also the loveliest team. And she's so lovely. Is she? I've she's never met such before. a sweet player but irrelevant she's also just like insanely good on the pitch so that's who I'm choosing. I might merge these two questions because part of me thinks you might give you the same answer for both so I feel like it makes sense to merge Not the me. two. Where will England finish and who will win the World Cup? So I'm just going to merge them. <laughs> I think it makes sense. I see what you did there. I want to go bold. Who are you going with? Haiti. <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if Haiti and Ireland <laughs> in the World Cup final. It shouldn't be that funny. <laughs> but if that does happen, we will clip this up and put it out. On, the, on three, right. two, one. <laughs> well, I'm glad that me and Soph have got it right. Yeah, you both say lionesses? I think I said semi-final. Semi-final, yeah. France scare me. That's my thing. I think a happy France is a <laughs> scary prospect because an unhappy France got quite far, but they never quite get over the line. And I think what was missing with France I would was agree, happiness. generally. And I have said it to you that I'm scared about France. But also France's propensity to break down at some point in a tournament mentally, just in terms of why, whether it's- But No, 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 but not necessarily. I think it has been a theme of French teams for many, many years, that they haven't been able to get past a certain point because there's just something. It was a bit like, I think it was a men's Dutch team a while back who should have literally won everything on the planet and they just could not get there. And I think it's the same with this French team. They have the talent, but there's something that there's not quite clicking to not get them. For me, that's who I'm worried about England meeting in the semi finals. So that's what I think they're going to. I think all you need to do though is just park the bus for the first half and then France just tie themselves out in the second. So sure. you'll be fine. Um, you should tell Serena that actually. I actually have had a word with her. Yeah. I've just said like France look like a threat, but actually, Serena, if you just have Don't worry about it. 11 people behind the ball, you should be absolutely fine. And she was like, Do you know what, Chloe? I've not thought of that. <laughs> 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 I, I feel like I don't even need to ask you why you've got lionesses for both of yours, but go on, you can have 30 seconds. I actually just genuinely think that, I think that the mentality is there. I think, yes, we have, I, I do feel a little bit less confident going into this tournament than I did the Euros, for sure. We have had a lot of injuries, we have to appreciate that. But at the same time, there was just such a buzz and an atmosphere around it. We do have the time difference against us. Um, and there's been obviously a lot of controversy about the broadcasting rights and all the stuff with like when players are going to go to the tournament and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's been a bit hairy. But also, I think they've got that experience in large tournaments to pull through. Um, and I do think we've been through a lot of experiences in terms of losing games or being behind, being in front and losing. So I do, I think we've built up that that skill set now. OK, well, it leads us nicely into our next section, which is talking about who England should be worried about. Some of the other teams that are going to pose threats mm -hmm. in the World Cup. We've touched on France briefly there, but of course they have had issues in the past with their manager who they've managed to get rid of. Unfortunately, it took an awful lot of players having to do quite worrying things where they stepped away from their club and Wendy Renard is back, thankfully. Um, but Hervé Renard has uh, stepped in, him in his white shirt. You might know him from coaching Saudi Arabia in the Qatar World Cup. Um, so he's come in um, and a lot of those players have come back and those players have been brought back in like Eugenie Samer who've been kind of cast aside for a little while so as we've touched on they are going to be um, a little bit of a worry. USA, mm -hmm. have we all seen their Fox commercial? Yes. No? 
oh wow, you need to watch that. It is arrogance personified, but it's everything you'd expect from USA because if any team deserves to be arrogant, it's the USA. What are they doing? Oh, it's, it's basically how everyone in the world is just focusing on how to stop the USA. That's what all the ads are. And they have all these like really caricature people from like different parts of the world saying like, you need to tackle them. No, you need to do this. Like, stop you know, them, cancel their flight. <laughs> yeah, the Australian, like they have like a Qantas airline member going, you know, their flight could get cancelled. And um, so it's it's quite interesting. <laughs> and uh, basically Alex Morgan is like, yeah, good luck. So it is the... Is this headed by Rapido? This sounds like a Rapido <laughs> move. No. It's Fox. Obviously. I actually really liked it, and I don't normally like that kind of stuff. But I just thought, like, I think they know that the game has upped massively since 2019, and that they are no longer the front runners that they once were. They're still bloody good. They like, have their noses in front. They're brilliant. Yeah, they're not clear favourites. Got, if we're to talk about a, a horse race, you know, they've they've they're the a better furlong ahead. They're l the gap is closing. Okay, you're in your you know, races. I love an analogy. I do, um, but like. They, they've still got that mentality edge over everyone, I think, because they d they've been there before, they've won it, and they're after their third successive uh, World Cup, which w no one's done before. Um, so I, I think it's, yeah, they've got that edge there, but I think they do kind of know that everyone else is, is has closing, in. closing that gap, and they've got a real challenge on their hands, and their injuries are quite significant too. We all mm. talk about England's in injuries. Becky Sauerbrunn, their captain, their leader, um, is, out, is out with a mm. foot injury. Makara has got her ACL. Um, Swanson. Mallory Swanson did her patella. So there's massive problems. They're waiting on the fitness of Megan Rapinoe and uh, Rose Ravel as well. They've both been back out in the NWSL recently. So there's some some issues there that they're going to have to overcome. But they do have some of the best young players on the planet. So that is a bold advert to put out. It is bold, but like <laughs> in the midst of those injuries, I feel like they've done enough. I mean, of course, it does its, jo its job. It irks you, right? It's supposed to rub you up the wrong way. That's the point. But I think if any team is going to do that, they've kind of earned the, earned the bragging rights, haven't they? But I do feel like teams do better when they keep it subtle and humble. Not if you're the USA, it seems, because they just they keep do doing well. Well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Let's park the USA. Germany lost in the quarterfinals the last time of the World Cup. Obviously, England beat them in the Euros final. You were saying, you said earlier, you think they're... I think they're strongest. Scary. Yeah, oh, I think... You look at that team from back to front. Merle Frohm's in goal, one of the best keepers on the planet. Uh, Lena Oberdorf is so talented in that, that kind of, what we know as the Kira Walsh role. She is, she's only 21. She just pulls the strings in there like she's been there forever. She was mad actually in the um, Champions League final. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So, so good. And Alex Pop. Uh, Alexandra Pop. Oh God. Absolutely. You just need to mark her head. Not Actually, quite. Yeah. Keep her on the floor. Yeah. It's that. Just pull her she down. She does spend a lot of time on the floor, but keep her like not jumping. And then you're not even talking. No one picked up on that dig. Come on. Pop flop. She spends a lot of time on the floor. They're, ju they're just yeah. solid all now the way through. Now you're running through the names. I'm listen. starting to feel a bit fearful. Uh, yeah, listen. Actually. Okay. <laughs> Quickly, let's move on very quickly. We touched on France. How are Australia going to do? Home tournament. Let's wrap up with them. Surely they're a threat. Well, they look strong. I mean, they, the game they had against the Lionesses, I mean, that's a huge, you know, a huge win for them. Um, and the worst thing was that we were also invited to the uh, Australian Embassy, like, what, a few days after that game? Was it the day after the day that after, game? Yeah. Uh, to this beautiful, it was the Matildas, like, the Matildas are there, and they were doing this, like, lovely, like, presentation. The documentary. Like, oh, my coming gosh. Coming out, yeah, it was lovely. What a great way to rub our faces in, mm. uh, you taking down our record. Um, but I mean, Sam Kerr, like you said, she's always going to be the one that just poses that threat, that she produces those moments of magic, like, like, like you said. Um, and yeah, they've got the chance to prove themselves in their nation. So I just think that's always, that's always the advantage. We had the home advantage last year. So yeah, big. Well, we will see. We will all be there. We have jam-packed this episode. We have had Laura Coombs, Katie Robinson, Neve Charles talking to us. You know, we've seen a little bit of the training session outside. We've had the wonderful Chloe Morgan joining us as well. We've tried to go through all the teams, which is not easy because there are 32 of them. Sophie, of course, keeping me company as well. We will both be down there covering the World Cup. So make sure you follow all of 90 Min's channels, subscribe to all the channels, follow all the content because 90 Min Talks will be coming to you weekly during the World Cup. So we will keep you up to date with everything. See you then. La magie du foot, c'est pour ça que nous sommes tous ici. Ça permet la fusion. Take a seat. The whole world is playing. The whole world is watching. No pressure. Grab a controller. Get comfortable. You're here to represent. To lead. So lean in.
in. Focus. Rise above. Revel in it. And leave your mark. We got this. Play the Women's World Cup. Now in the World Game. Yeah. 